Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here today to talk about Delta Lake and how it can make it easier to manage your data lakes. However, before I get into that, I want to kind of start by talking about the world before Delta. And I want to do that with uh, kind of a, you know, the, the promise of the data lake, why we think data lakes are actually pretty cool. Because there are some people who say, you know, why would you even use a data lake? Why is it better than a traditional relational database or data warehouse? And I actually think there are some important things there that make them significantly better. And a big part of it is this idea that you should just collect everything. You have a lot of data. It could be structured customer data. It could be stuff like video and speech. It could be stuff coming from IoT sensors. Um, and the nice thing about the data lake is it's cheap and it's super scalable. So you can actually collect everything. You don't have to spend a bunch of time up front putting a schema on it. You might say, why is that good? Well, it takes time to put a schema on it. You don't know what data is valuable ahead of time all the time. And so with the data lake, you just collect everything. And the idea is once you've collected everything, you store it all in your data lake. And now you can do machine learning and data science. You can build recommendation engines. You can cure cancer with genomics and DNA sequencing. Um, but I have kind of a bad news for you. The dirty secret here is your data is garbage, almost always when you first get it. And so you store garbage data in your data lake and you have the standard problem of garbage in, garbage out. And so your analyses and your machine learning are also incorrect. And why is this? Like what, what actually does it look like when you build a, a data lake project and what are some of the challenges that you run into? Well, I'm gonna start with kind of a fairly simple setup. Uh, you know, I'm sure many of you have done this in your, in your day jobs, but the, the problem is this. My boss came to me and he's got a stream of events in Kafka and he wants me to do two different things with them. He wants me to do streaming analytics so we can understand what's happening uh, you know, with our business in real time. And he also wants me to do AI and reporting where I take a more longitudinal historical view and maybe predict what's going to happen in the future by looking at what happened in the past. So how do we go about doing this? Well, I'm obviously a little bit biased, but I would start by using Spark. It has an awesome built-in connector to speak to Kafka. It has uh, streaming APIs that do cool things like event time aggregation. Uh, and so, you know, we can kind of write some Spark SQL queries and get that streaming analytics. Uh, unfortunately, that brings us to challenge number one, which is historical queries. Kafka is great when you want to know what's happening at this moment, when you want to store a week or maybe a month of data. But if you start storing petabytes of data in Kafka, things are probably going to tip over. So I did a bunch of reading on the internet, and it seems like there's this pattern called uh, the Lambda architecture. And as far as I can tell, this just means you do everything twice. We're going to have a streaming system that computes stuff in real time. We'll have a batch system that stores data and computes it you know, uh, asynchronously in batch. Fortunately, Spark has uh, you know, unified APIs for streaming in batch. So it's relatively simple to do this, but it's still two sets of programs and schedules and errors that I need to deal with. But you know. I'm a good engineer, I can get this done. So we set up the Lambda architecture. We start storing data in the data lake. Uh, we'll add that to our kind of list of solutions that we need to have. Uh, and now we can do AI and reporting directly out of that data lake that we created. Done, right? That unfortunately brings us to challenge number two, which is messy data. And the kind, you know, this is exactly what I said before, uh, you know, garbage in. So uh, this is a, you know, again, I've seen this, this problem solved quite a bit. Uh, a typical way to do it is you write a whole bunch of validation programs or you use one of these validation frameworks like DQ or Great Expectations. You write a bunch of separate validations um, and you run them and they you know, email you when something goes wrong and you go in and you fix your program to handle that particular kind of messy data. Because of the Lambda architecture, I have to introduce these validations into two different places. But you know, again, unified APIs make this relatively simple. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and set that up and uh, add validations to our list of things and we're good to go. That unfortunately brings us to challenge number three, which is mistakes and failures. So it was great that we added these validations, but they don't catch problems until they've already made it into the data lake. And so I actually need to go and correct incorrect data that has made it into storage. And this isn't a relational database. It's just a bunch of files that are stored out there. So modifying them in place can be difficult. So a, a pretty common pattern here uh, is to set up a reprocessing framework. So the idea is instead of storing all of your data in one giant directory, we'll partition it. Uh, and usually time is a good dimension here. We'll partition it by days, hours, minutes, whatever kind of makes sense for the scale of data I'm working with. And we'll build this reprocessing framework so that if anything goes wrong, 
Now I don't have to reason about updating data in place, which is very difficult and you know, eventually a consistent file system. Instead, we'll delete everything and reprocess that partition of data, and we'll use that to correct these mistakes and failures. That, and that works, so we'll add that to our kind of bag of tricks, and that unfortunately brings us to challenge number four, which is updates. GDPR happens, CCPA happens, these things where you're not really just updating a single partition, you actually need to scan your entire data lake and you know, respect somebody's right to be forgotten. Or you wanna do change data capture. You have a feed coming from your operational system and you want to merge those updates into a table. <sighs> so this is a whole nother set of things we need to do, um, but you know, we're good Spark engineers. We can write Spark programs to do these. It's just a bunch of filters and joins and projections and things. So we write all of those jobs, we run them against the data lake, we're very careful to deal with partial failures. In fact, that's actually really hard. Um, and we gotta be very careful because while we're modifying it, there's no isolation. So we'll schedule it, we'll do all of our work at night and uh, you know, we'll tell other people to run their reports during the day. I've seen a whole bunch of solutions to this. I even saw one person who, because they were afraid of these kind of uh, you know, scheduling and atomicity problems, what, at once every 30 days, they actually just copied their entire data lake and filtered out the people that wanted to be forgotten. So they were cutting it just down to the wire of the GDPR deadline. But again, we're good engineers, we can make this work. But as you can see, there's a whole bunch of challenges. This system that was just gonna be me doing some data analytics became this very complicated distributed system. And really, I think kind of the theme here is you're wasting time and money solving these well-known systems problems instead of doing what your actual job is, which is to extract value from data. And just to kind of summarize the distractions that I think keep you from getting your job done, uh, you know, uh, the data lake by itself has no atomicity. This means that when one of your production job fails in the middle, it leaves partial results out there. So your table is actually in a corrupt state and you need to figure out how to fix it. Partitioning is one strategy, but that doesn't work when you need to change, you know, the entire table. Uh, and there's no quality enforcement. Nobody stops me from dropping data in that is incorrect or that doesn't match the schema. And I don't find out until read time that there was a problem here. And then finally, there's no support for consistency or isolation. So it's up to me to have very careful schedules so two people aren't modifying or reading the same table at the same time. It makes it almost impossible to mix, mix uh, streaming and batch into the same workload. Uh, and all of these together mean that you spend a lot of time distracted. And so I kind of want to switch over now to talk about Delta Lake and how it makes it significantly easier. So we're going to take this very complicated architecture and we're going to replace it with this, where data kind of moves uh, you know, incrementally and, and you're going to improve it. And the, the, the tricks that make this possible are, first of all, we have full ACID transactions. So this is a standard database concept. You know, it's atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable. And this means that really each of those programs acts as though it's operating in complete isolation. And you never really have to worry about the failures because if they happen, it cleans up after itself. And uh, in addition to having, uh, you know, asset transactions, Delta Lake is an open standard and it's fully open source. Uh, last year, we announced that we were donating the project to the Linux Foundation. And I think this is really important. You know, data has gravity, it has inertia. If I was storing petabytes of my organization's most valuable data somewhere, I wouldn't want that to be some vendor specific black box format. And so, you know, we're working with the Presto community. Starburst announced their, their reader for it. We have a great connector for Spark. We also have a connector for Hive. And the entire transaction protocol is out there on GitHub if you want to implement your own connector for, you know, the processing framework or machine learning framework of your choice. And then finally, uh, you know, the current implementation is uh, deeply powered by Spark. And the nice things about this are it unifies streaming and batch. So any of the Spark SQL APIs work seamlessly with, with Delta Lake. And it's very easy to convert your existing jobs. You really only have to change one or two lines of code and you just get these much nicer semantics. And I'll actually show an example later in this talk of what it's like to take an existing Spark program and convert it. So now I wanna simplify the picture a bit. And I wanna talk about some patterns that start to emerge once you stop being distracted by these distributed systems problems and start focusing on data quality. And one of the things that I've seen a lot, and I wanna kind of clarify here, these are generalities. These are not specific features of Delta, uh, but these are what happen when you start thinking about quality rather than systems problems. 
So the first thing is you start realizing that what you really want to do is you want to incrementally improve the quality of your data until it's ready for consumption. It's not a one-stop process. And I think that's actually a good thing. And I want to walk through kind of each of the steps and why each of them is valuable. So starting at the beginning, uh, we have our bronze data or our raw data, and this is a dumping ground for everything. And as I said before, I think it's actually valuable that you can collect this raw garbage data because you don't know what's going to be valuable later. This might be the one feature that you actually need to train your model and you know, get better predictive performance. And one of the nice things here is Delta Lake makes it possible to store years and years of data in a single table. And I'll show you kind of later how we handle all of the scalability here. Another kind of magic trick about storing the raw data is you avoid error prone parsing. There are no bugs in a parser that you don't write. And so that means that if there ever is a mistake in your later analysis, you can always go back and reprocess the original data. After bronze comes silver. So this is where I've started to do filtering or augmentation. Uh, you know, I've, I've kind of cleaned up, I've normalized. Um, and you, know, this, you might ask, why are, are we materializing this if it's not the final answer? Isn't it expensive to store it? And there's actually a couple of them, and one of them, a couple of reasons, and one of them I found kind of surprising. So one is, of course, this intermediate data might be useful for your coworkers. So uh, you know, having it there available to them as a materialized table is, is a great way to kind of share that work that you did already. The thing that surprised me more that I found a bunch of people doing though is actually using these intermediate tables for debugging. When something is wrong with your gold analysis, it's very helpful to have the full power of SQL to query these intermediate results. You can ask questions like, in how many cases was this column null? Or how many distinct values were here? Uh, and that will help you find what's going wrong in your ETL process. And then finally, we get to gold data. This is clean data, ready for consumption. You can read it with Spark or Presto. I should have updated this slide because Presto support is actually already available now. Uh, and so you, know, you can plug it into all of your favorite tools or even BI tools, um, which I think is actually pretty cool. And there's a couple of other patterns that I've seen a lot of people get success with in, in the Delta Lake. One is an increased use of streaming. So the idea here is rather than have a bunch of batch jobs that move data through the data lake, uh, you'll use streaming. And the reason here is streaming is actually about incremental ETL. A lot of people think that it's this very complex thing that you do only when you want really fast, uh, you know, low latency performance. And that is something we support. But the thing that streaming really is, is asking the question, what data has changed since the last time I ran this job? How do I take that new data only, process it incrementally, push it downstream while checkpointing where I'm at in case there's a failure so I can pick up where I left off? That's a lot of manual code that people have to write in their batch jobs that is just automatically taken care of for you when you use streaming. And uh, you know, the kind of nice thing here is you still do have this cost latency, cost latency trade-off that you can make pretty easily. If you want low latency, you can use uh, microbatch or continuous processing mode. If you want, you know, if your data only arrives once a month and you don't want that cluster running all the time, you can use trigger once mode. And, uh, and I think that really kind of allows you to pick the right cost for any particular application. Of course, it's not all streaming. Delta has full support for batch jobs as well, including all of the standard DML that you're familiar uh, with from your data warehouse. So you can do inserts, update, delete, merge. You can atomically overwrite multiple partitions. And this is great for problems like retention when you're only allowed to keep data for a certain period of time, corrections, uh, you know, uh, change data capture, and also, as I mentioned before, GDPR. And another really powerful thing about using streaming and about keeping all of the raw data around is it makes it easy to recompute when business logic changes or when there's a bug. If at any point you wanna do a backfill and you wanna kind of reprocess all of your data from the beginning of time, it's as easy as clearing out the table or creating a new table and creating a new checkpoint. And what happens when you start a stream off of a Delta table is it starts by taking a snapshot of the table at the moment the stream was started it takes that snapshot and breaks it up into little pieces so it can process it incrementally. And then as soon as it's done processing the state of the world at that moment, it starts tailing the transaction log, looking for new data that has arrived, continually keeping the results up to date. And so what you get is this really efficient incremental Spark job that's actually much easier to scale and run than a traditional Spark job, even when you're processing petabytes of data. 
So I want to talk a little bit about people are using it. Now the project has been out for almost three years now. Uh, it's used by thousands of organizations around the world, and we process exabytes of data per month. Uh, I want to talk about one particular use case, which is Comcast. Uh, you know, in this case, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with, with Comcast, but this particular problem, uh, they wanted to do sessionization. They had people, uh, you know, clicking, going back and forth from ESPN to the home shopping network, back to ESPN, and they want to really understand that content journey. So they want to take all of those clicks, group them by user, and segment them by time. Uh, and they were running this on Spark for years, but in the past, it turns out it was just too big for Spark to handle. And what they ended up doing is what any good engineer would do when they have a scalability problem. They take it and they uh, partition it by user ID. So they're just going to hash partition the users across a bunch of different clusters. In this case, they had 10 different clusters with 10 different Spark jobs, and they were able to get it to run. However, uh, you know, that's now 10 extra schedules, 10 extra clusters, 10 sets of errors to deal with. And so the kind of really cool thing is when they switch it to Delta Lake, uh, because of our improved metadata handling, uh, we were actually able to collapse this down into one job that actually used one tenth of the hardware that they were using before. So it was both, uh, you know, more productive and faster in that regard, but it was also faster when it came to, uh, you know, the cost of running this job. And so I thought that was a, a pretty cool result here. So if you're convinced, you might be asking, how should I use this thing? And the answer is, if you're an existing user of Spark, it's super easy. All you need to do is add our library. Uh, you can in install it with just adding an argument to the Spark shell. Uh, if you're building uh, you know, a Java or a Scala program, you can depend on it with Maven. Uh, and then, and we're actually on pip now if you want to install it there as well. Um, but all you need to do is change the format that you're reading from, from Parquet, CSV, JSON, whatever you're using today, to Delta. And you will automatically get all of the nice asset transactions and scalable metadata management that we talked about before. So now you might be saying, this seems too good to be true. How can you possibly get asset transactions on top of these cloud storage systems? I know they're scalable, but they have eventual consistency. So I'm going to spend uh, you know, the last couple of minutes walking through this part. So first of all, Delta on disk is still stored you know, in the file system along with a bunch of Parquet files. And so you'll see there's kind of two different sets of files here. We have the transaction log, which has a bunch of different JSON files. And we'll also talk about the checkpoints in a moment. Each of those it represents a version of the table as it moves through time. And then uh, we also have these optional partition directories. I say these are optional because actually all of the partitioning is handled by our transaction log. Uh, so you can also do exotic things like spread all of your Parquet files out by random partitions if you're trying to optimize the performance on S3. But just for the sake of compatibility with other systems and understandability uh, you know, when compared to existing tools, by default, we will still create those partition directories. And then inside of them, we have data files. And these are just standard Parquet that can be read, read with any system that supports Parquet. But the trick here is, rather than having just one version of the table, we're actually going to have all of the Parquet files from multiple versions of the table. This is a kind of standard database trick called multi-version concurrency control, or MVCC. And what we're going to do is we're going to then have the transaction log record how the table changes over time. So for any version, you can figure out what the current set of files are. So in each of those JSON files I showed before, there are, can be different actions. And those actions are basically the table in the previous version plus those actions create the new version. So an example of an action is you can change the metadata of the table. For example, I'll change its name or its human readable description. I'll change the schema. I'll change the partitioning. You record that by saying, here is the new metadata for the table. Another operation is to add or remove data from the table. So we can add a file or remove a file. And when we add a file, we can also store some optional statistics, things like the, the min and max value um, uh, of any given column, the number of nulls, the number of rows. Uh, and, and that is used later by the system to do data skipping and partition pruning. Uh, and then finally, of course, you know, we, this isn't an append-only structure, so we need to be able to remove data as well. So you can say, remove this file that was present in a previous version from the table. And so the result is, when you play the log forward to any specific version, you can get, uh, you, you get the current state of the table, which is, here is the metadata, and here is the list of files that are, that are present. 
Uh, the other nice kind of trick here is because you have all of these versions stored, you can also use this to do time travel. So you can actually go back in time by not playing the log all the way to the end. As long as you haven't deleted those files, uh, that, that's totally possible. Now, so that's part of it. That's, that's kind of how we get versioning and consistency. But now you're going to say, well, how do we get atomicity? That nice trick that if something happens, it either happens completely or it doesn't happen at all. And the trick here is when we create those version files, we're going to do them using uh, atomic primitives on the underlying file system. So as an example here, let's say I want to do compaction. I have a bunch of data and it's in small files. And I want to make it into big files. So uh, you know, version zero adds these two files to it. And then version one atomically removes those two files and adds that data back in because we never want to be in the state where the removes happen and not the add, because then we lose data, or the add happens, but not the removes, because then we would have duplicate data. And so when we create this JSON file, depending on the underlying file system, we'll use different techniques for doing it. On S3, uh, uploads are guaranteed to be atomic, because you start the put operation by saying, here's how many bytes to expect. Don't accept this right unless you get all of these bytes. On other storage systems like GCS or Azure Data Lake, we'll use atomic rename. So we'll create a temporary file and rename it to its final destination. And they guarantee you will get either none of the file or the entire file when you do that operation. So we've got atomicity now, but let's talk about consistency. And in order to get consistency, we're going to try to ensure this property called serializability, which means that there is one serial schedule that explains how the table has changed, even if multiple users were changing it at the same time. It'll be as though they were going one at a time. And so in order for this to happen, we have to agree on that order of changes, even when there are multiple writers to the table. So we're going to here rely on a, a, a trick called mutual exclusion. So the idea here is, you know, uh, ver user one creates version zero, user two creates version one. But if they both try to create version two at the same time, one of them must be excluded. They must get an error that says, nope, version two already exists. You need to check yourself and, uh, and, and see what happened. And you might say, well, wait a second. If every time two people do something at the same time, it fails, it sounds like I have a bunch of conflicts to, to deal with. Fortunately, we have this kind of conflict resolution policy where we check to see if the set of operations that were done by these two users are disjoint. If they didn't overlap at all, we can say it doesn't matter what order they went in. And so we can actually just kind of resequence it and have user two retry automatically, uh, you know, creating that next commit without the user even knowing that there was a conflict. And so the trick for doing this is when we, when, we, uh, when we see that there's a conflict, basically we start by recording the start version, we record any operations that happen, we attempt to commit, and if somebody else wins, uh, you know, the user two just automatically tries again. Uh, the kind of final trick I want to talk about here is massive metadata. So it's actually not uncommon for Delta tables to have hundreds of thousands or even millions of files. And it's anybody who's tried to store hundreds or even thousands of partitions in the Hive Metastore knows big metadata can really slow down and hurt the stability of your, of your big data processing. And so the trick here is we're actually going to take metadata and we're going to try to treat it as data and use a, data, a big data processing system to handle it. So how do we do that? We just take all of these actions that exist in the transaction log. We read them in with Spark. We use a Spark shuffle to kind of group by the file name, cancel out adds and removes to come up with the current snapshot of the table. And then we store that in Parquet. So in most cases, we're not actually reading this super long transaction log and needing to do all of this resolution. Instead, we just read this uh, Parquet file, find the files that are relevant. We can look at all of the statistics for the files, which are stored in there in the checkpoint as well. Identify only the files that are actually relevant to our particular query. Uh, and then, uh, you know, pass that on to Spark where the real processing begins. And so with this trick now, it doesn't matter how big the table is. Uh, you can kind of, you can still handle, handle it uh, by, by leveraging Spark kind of out of core processing and shuffle and all of those things. Cool. So with that, I want to encourage you to check out our website, uh, you know, delta.io. It has getting started guide, so you can try it out. Uh, we also link to the source code and the protocol if you want to learn more. Join us on Slack. We're super active there. So if you have questions about how to use Spark or Delta or any of these things, uh, check it out.